Oh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to some. Welcome to day four of virtual aviation. I'm Amanda Simpson, Vice President for Research and Technology at Airbus Americas and a member of the AIAA Aviation Executive Steering Committee. I will tell you that I'm particularly and personally disappointed that we're not in Reno right now as that's where my son lives and I'm limited to connecting with him virtually. And I hope that you've been reaching out to colleagues and meeting potential collaborators via the virtual networking events and chat feature. There's certainly been a lot to discuss. Now, today we'll be learning about advanced mobility and electric aircraft and the promise these advanced technologies hold for the industry and our daily lives. Now, right now, I wanna congratulate some of our tech, tech, uh, technical excellence award winners who are helping to advance our industry. Louis J. Lanzarotti, New Jersey Institute of Technology, won the 2020 AIAA James A. Van Allen Space Environments Award for significant contributions to our understanding of the space environment of the Van Allen radiation belts and leadership in establish, establishing so, uh, uh, so, social. Uh, I, you know, I'm having a problem with this word, establishing societal awareness of space weather. Mark R. Mellison, Lockheed Martin Aeronautics, retired, won the 2020 AIAA Ground Testing Award for contributions to development and ground testing of the F-35 for decades of wind tunnel testing and for sustained contributions to AIAA in multiple leadership roles. Now, a quick reminder about the chat feature, which will, you will see on the right of your viewing screen. Please use it to ask questions of our speaker during the plenary Q&A, and I'll get back to that at the end. And please be patient as there is a slight pause between speakers as they move to the virtual stage. So let me move on, and we're going to introduce Grazia Vitalini, the Airbus Chief Technology Officer. Now, born in Italy and raised in the U.S., Grazia leads Airbus's ambition to build the future of flight. She began her career as part of the Eurofighter Consortium, where she used her first paycheck to earn her private pilot's license. In 2002, she joined Airbus in Germany, where she has contributed to the A380, A350, A320, and A400M programs as she moved into more senior management positions, including technical authority for all Airbus aircraft. Grazia was executive vice president and head of engineering of Airbus Defense and Space before she was became CTO in May of 2018. As such, she is a member of the Airbus Executive Committee, the first woman to be on Airbus's top management team. Today, Grazia leads the transnational team that spans the globe with facilities in Europe, China, and the Americas that is leading the transformation to sustainable, electric, autonomous, and zero emissions air transportation. She is the ideal person to discuss the future of advanced mobility and, it, and electric aircraft. So I'm very excited to welcome to the virtual stage from her office in Autobrunn, just south of Munich, Germany, the CTO of Airbus, Grazia Vitadini. Thank you so much, Amanda, for the very warm welcome and for your kind introduction. Good morning, AIAA, and good afternoon while here from Munich and to everyone um, joining from, from Europe. I am so delighted to have the chance 
to talk to, or more importantly, with all of you, aerospace industrialists, enthusiasts, and the entire AIAA community around the globe. AIAA is the world's largest aerospace professional society. And if I look at your purpose, you describe it as to ignite ingenuity and collaboration. And this couldn't be more fitting for the times because this is exactly what aerospace needs right now. So thank you for having me. Thank you for this great opportunity. I'm very much looking forward to exchanging with you during this next hour. So, so much has changed since I accepted um, your, your awesome invitation back in January to come and speak to all of you here at the IAAA uh, forum. So originally I had expected we'd just meet in person, you know, come together in one room and discuss how we can align the exponential growth of air traffic with our responsibility to advance climate neutral air travel for future generations after ours. Well, however, today it's just a few months later and we found ourselves each sitting physically distanced from one another, scattered around the globe, staying home instead of flying in, healing and adapting to, to a new normality. And well, frankly, I was very much looking forward to, to flying back to Reno, but indeed, our industry has been literally turned on its head. And in the past months, we've been very focused on supporting the entire ecosystem, our, our customers, our suppliers, our people, to ensure the industry basically stays afloat. And instead of talking about exponential growth of air travel, we were wondering, will we have enough pilots to fly all these aircraft? like we did you know, for the last few years. The questions we're asking ourselves now are totally different. So what does the demand for air travel look like in our post-pandemic reality? Will there ever be significant demand for air travel again? Is it safe to fly again? When, how? And even if we assume that demand will return, you may wonder, can the aviation industry really afford to care about things like decarbonizing air travel after such a crisis? These are the most imminent questions today, right? So let me tackle them right away. My answer is a resounding yes. Yes, we will see demand for air travel coming back. And yes, we will remain committed to sustainability now more than we were before. And if you allow me to, I'll take the next 20 minutes or so to explain the rationale behind, behind my answer. I'll also address what has surfaced as priorities due to the current crisis and also what we're learning from it. I will address how airlines, our customers, and aviation as a whole need to double down on economics and sustainability to secure our current survival and future success. And I'll also outline how we as industry keep our focus on ensuring economics and efficiency of our aircraft, as well as on health and safety of our passengers. So let, let's get straight into the, the, first, the first topic. I, I'm sure you know the figures. Over the past months, daily air travel has been down some 80% compared to last year. So it's fair to ask whether, or at least when, um, air travel uh, will recover from, from that, right? So in the current phase of, of uncertainty, forecasting is pretty difficult also because there's nothing to relate to. There's no previous model we can use to understand where we are in the process. So let's just take one step back and let's refocus the question on its very essence. What is aerospace really about 
what is the quintessence of what we do. Now, for me, the answer is absolutely clear. I mean, we connect the world. Aircraft transport people and goods faster and further than any other means of transport. And there is no technology in sight that could replace aircraft in this respect anytime soon. I mean, yes, digital technologies are fantastic to fill the gap and be able to meet virtually, but this does not replace the human component. And also, it doesn't transport goods. So if you ask, will we still need such a global transport capacity after the crisis? I dare say yes, yes. We have witnessed the need for air transport in this very crisis every single day. We witness the essential role of aviation to overcome this crisis. We've seen thousands of respirators, millions of doctors, patients, citizens stranded abroad, billions, billions of protective masks being transported around the globe at great speed. In comparison, just uh, to have the reference fresh um, in our minds, one single cargo ships from China to Europe travels about a month. This combination of reach and pace is, in my view, the unique value that only aviation can offer. We see the need for this capability and the provision of urgent supplies. Just think about the potential when it comes to distribution of a future coronavirus vaccine, for instance. We see the need for this capability in the provision of our everyday goods. And we see the need for this capability in the exchange of people and cultures. Up to half the travelers in recent years stated that they were visiting friends and relatives. We'll try to do that by video conferencing. We've experienced it. It's great. It's a fantastic means, but it doesn't replace being there in person. So these are the reasons why people's demand for air travel grows faster than their economic wealth. These are the reasons why over the past decades we've observed global air traffic growing about twice as fast as the global GDP. And today, nobody can say when we will return to these growth rates. What we all do know is that the existing fleet of 21,000 aircraft was far from being enough to satisfy the human demand for global mobility. But let's set all figures aside just for a moment. You know, just, just recently, I, 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 I read a news, an article, where, where the author, well, quite a skeptical person, was, was really questioning the future of aviation. And yet, nonetheless, he closed his text by saying, I feel there is no substitute for the beauty of the world out there. And to me, that says it all. There's an undeniable, inextricable link between emotions and flying. And we all know this feeling. It's a feeling that came, you know, when, when we first engineered machines that took to the skies, stimulating the human desire for connection, for curiosity. And at least in Europe, we're starting to see this feeling materialize in the rival travel bookings and share prices as borders have gradually started reopening, again, over the very, very few um, past days. The trend is positive. And that leads us to the second question. So, is the aerospace industry as such still committed to climate action? Well, let's face it. I think that when people ask that question, they actually think something else. <laughs> A question of the sorts of, will aviation industry still be committed on, to climate action? Or will they just focus on, on, on getting profits back to where they used to be? And I believe we need to be very crystal clear here. This is a false choice because there's no profit without protection. Preserving our climate and our environment is not just, you know, the, the cherry on the cake. 
the add-on that we may choose, uh, you know, can we afford it or not? This is absolutely the prerequisite, the pillar upon which we must build the future of aviation, ecologically and economically. You know, for quite a while, um, great analytic thinkers like Jeremy Rifkin, for instance, um, point really at global public pension funds to massively divest from fossil fuel-based industries. Um, let's not forget another point. The EU, the European Union, last year declared a climate emergency and outlined a very ambitious plan for a European Green Deal. Uh, this very year, um, at the beginning of the year, Larry Fink surprised Wall Street by announcing plans to make sustainability his new global investment standard. And I was, I was attending the, the World Economic Forum in Davos back in January, and the climate protection movement dominated, literally, uh, the agenda. And the crisis, the coronavirus crisis we are facing, has even increased this global awareness of how dependent we are on a healthy environment. This is also why in Europe, government introduced economic stimulus plans are coming with green strings attached. So it's, it's very interesting to see uh, politics, certainly also motivated by the societal pressure on the topic, sees this unique opportunity to increase demand for and support of sustainable technologies in aerospace this way. And we see very strong, tangible signs of that, for instance, in France, where really combined with the very stringent environmental standards that European stakeholders expect from aviation and with our continuous and steadfast exploration of alternative propulsion, it's interesting to see how this provides an opportunity to create really a sound role model that could drive a strong momentum for the overall, for the global industry. And again, pressure for green solutions will further rise, I believe, when we get out of the crisis. The difference to the pre-corona world is that on top of pioneering climate neutral flight, People now also ask, how we look after their health on board? And this is absolutely reasonable and legitimate. So how do we do that? How do we protect people and the environment? Now, as aerospace professionals, we know the answer. We know that there is no solution to this question, or more precisely, that there's, there is not one single solution Aircraft are among the most complex products in the world. This is why we we'll need to activate on many, we need to activate and pull many, many levers to decarbonize aviation, to fly, to really fly climate neutral by 2050. That's our ambition and our commitment. We need to push on improved aerodynamics, on smart materials. We need to push for alternative fuels, alternative propulsion. We need to push for automated air traffic management. This is an, an aspect which is very often forgotten. Um, and we need to explore also new fields, emerging fields, not specific to our own industry, but definitely key to solve the this very complex equation. We're talking about like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, looking even, even further ahead. And we need to secure a successful business model for our own customers in the future by pushing, continuing to push autonomy, enabling technologies, allowing pilots to focus on the critical parts of, of their mission, as well as airlines to address the, the issue of, of pilot shortage, all while not compromising on our unwavering top priorities safety, health, and social acceptance. So at Airbus, um, we've been testing a very ambitious um, autonomous taxi takeoff and landing flight demonstrators to really accelerate our understanding of autonomy enabling technologies. And we've been doing this not only out of Europe, but really working hand in hand with our innovation 
center in the United States, a cube. I'm delighted to announce that with this demonstrator, we have recently reached a new milestone. After performing the first fully autonomous vision-based takeoff at the beginning of the year in January, we have just achieved the first fully automatic vision-based taxi and landing. This is the first time ever an aircraft has been able to take off taxi and land totally autonomously. The biggest, the, mo the biggest difficulty in this was just convincing the pilots not to do anything and to keep their hands off the throttle. Being able to, to come full circle is really a huge step forward to addressing key industrial challenges of tomorrow. At the same time, we must make clear how we look after anyone and anything that flies aboard one of our aircraft. And today we still have too little evidence suggesting that the risk of a virus infection is higher aboard aircraft. This is due, this is thanks also to the HEPA filters, exchanging cabin air every two to three minutes, clearing out more than 99.9% of virus and bacteria. To keep it really short, the air in the aircraft is as clean and safe as in a surgery medical room, okay? Well, we as aerospace experts are, are familiar, right, with, with this, with the heart fact. And we know that we are part of a huge ecosystem which took really great care over the last decades to build what is today proven to be the safest way to travel. But in this space, we really need to appeal to people uh, also on an emotional level to restore their trust and confidence in our industry, in our technology, and into our product. As far as our inventiveness goes, we must take it further. And this is absolutely what we're committed to at Airbus, where, for instance, we're working on using advanced uh, materials such as synthetic spider silk for antibacterial flight seats. We're working on far UVC lights for disinfection purposes and even on uh, coatings uh, which allow to use self-disinfecting surfaces that could be deployed in the laboratories or luggage racks, hat racks, for example, right? So our teams are really working on these topics at the crossroads between health and uh, new technology. But by far, the biggest challenge is that we will only be successful if we do all this coherently and concurrently, because the future of aviation We'll only start at the point where all these individual innovations converge into one single, safe, and clean solution. Ladies and gentlemen, the big challenge is our joint challenge. Since the, the early days of, of, our, of the aerospace industry, you know, there's a good old saying that an aircraft consists of one million parts flying in very close formation. Well, today, looking at the complexity of our industry with all its OEMs, uh, partners, suppliers, research institutions, and so on, we could really say aircraft are built by one million partners working in close formation. Here lies the key to our future. You know, just, just the other day, I was thinking back about a book I, I, I read some time ago from uh, Professor Nassim Taleb. Um, I know there's some, some controversial debate about, uh, around, around his thesis, uh, and we could certainly spend a lot of time to discuss whether the climate or corona crisis, what type of swan is it? Is it green? Is it, is it black? But in these days, I'm really particularly... Uh, interested in the concept of, of anti-fragility. This is Professor Nassim's uh, uh, concept. Anti-fragility 
means much more than just being robust or resilient to crises. It's not just that you know you you weather the crisis, you wait for it to go by, and then you come out. No, anti fragility is about our ability to grow and thrive in crisis from shocks and strains like muscles do. Right. I'm um, looking really at the uncertainty and at the complexity of our world. We can only achieve this by the unity of our community. And coming together in the world's largest aerospace organization while facing the industry's largest crisis, this is the moment where we start to grow together by learning from each other, by leaning on each other, by working together. Ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to our exchange and thank you so much for having me today here with you and thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, thank you, Grazia. And uh, I'm hopefully uh, appearing on the screens at this point. You can hear me. Okay, great. So we're getting a lot of questions coming in. Um, we're going to go ahead and start and talking about, you know, you mentioned decarbonization. The Airbus is focusing on that. So let me, I'm going to throw a couple of uh, questions here together into one. So what pathways is Airbus examining with regards to decarbonization? Um, is it electrification, uh, hydrogen power, zero emission? Um, yesterday, um, the CEO of Ariane talked about um, uh, actually pulling uh, fuel out of the air. So, I mean, is it all about decarbonization or are there other issues that, envir that environmentally Airbus is looking at? Thank you very much, Amanda. This is questions out there. So. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, it's it's fine. If I have, uh, I'll, I'll take the time to to articulate a bit uh, around these very very pertinent uh, questions, very much at the core of what we um, Airbus do when it comes to future uh, technologies. So, first of all, as an industry leader and as as Europe's key uh, aerospace manufacturer, well, it, it's a privilege, right, to have to have this role, but the privilege come with great responsibilities. We really believe that the onus is on us to work towards reducing our industry's impact on, on citizens, on the environment. And that's why we committed uh, to, to meet the environmental and technology targets outlined in the European, uh, European Commission's flight path 2050, we commit to support the industry's um, CO2 emission reduction targets communicated through the, the ATAC, the Air Transport um, Action Group. And this is quite a bold move because the solution to get there is not yet matured and demonstrated. So we took this commitment and that's what we're working uh, on really with uh, with full, uh, full speed ahead. Now, refocusing on decarbonizing aviation can only happen, again, if we work together, the whole industry, and, 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 and listen to each other and, uh, and, and, and manage bringing competitive zero emission solutions to the future of flight. So uh, we're engaging around about 2 billion at Airbus, 2 billion euros in R&D to explore all possible solutions. And we're investing and focusing on six main pillars, improving the eco efficiency of the fleet as it is, as it is today, um, developing a new alternative propulsion technologies with promising environmental benefits in the sense of um, emissions, but also definitely uh, developing and deploying sustainable um, alternative fuel, developing new eco-efficient materials. Let's not forget that. We're trying to decarbonize emissions, but we don't think that, for instance, um, uh, CFRPs, uh, main uh, ingredients, both in terms of fibers and in terms of resin, is, is absolutely fossil fuel-based. It's carbon. So new eco-efficient materials are definitely one of the pillars. 
um, fostering partnerships, uh, we shall not fall in the trap of thinking that we know it all. <laughs> Very often, it's really through opening up and open innovation also that new solutions come to life and investing in, in air traffic management um, solutions. We're looking at different timelines. So um, on short term, um, we are working to the objectives set back in 2008 to improve the fleet fuel efficiency by, by 1.5% per annum until 2020. And today we are way beyond that. We are at a rolling average of 2.1% per annum. This through updates of the fleet with the latest technology improvements. Think of the A320neo, the A330neo, and the A350. On midterm, we know there's an offsetting scheme. Um, it, it, it's the Corsia uh, objective to ensure neutral carbon growth of aviation from 2020 to 2035. So it's the ICAO's um, carbon offsetting and reduction system um, scheme for international aviation. And we absolutely need uh, all the states to support it, to ensure its environmental integrity, really. Then going beyond that, well, if we look at 2050, we're definitely pressing ahead research and development into a new generation of aircraft with a radically new design, cleaner technologies, which do include hybrid electric engines, alternative fuels, and hydrogen technology. Where on alternative fuels, um, well, we it's, it's a great example we really see the power of cross-industry collaboration. There is a cross-industry CTO group, so where I, I liaise with, uh, with partners of the like of CTOs of Boeing, of Lockheed, of all the engine manufacturers, GE, Rolls-Royce, Safran, uh, Dassault as other OEM. And that's uh, then at, at the last uh, uh, Paris Air Show, we raised our voice to speak for alternative, sustainable, alternative fuels to really raise the awareness uh, in industries adjacent to ours about the investments that are necessary in order to make these alternatives really feasible. So um, really, there's going to be huge, huge efforts needed in developing the right incentive policies for all these new technologies. Um, and, uh, and this is something where we're highly engaged, uh, engaged into. Um, indeed, I mentioned electrification. We do acknowledge absolutely the, uh, the fact that uh, electric propulsion has the potential to revolutionize flight. Um, so this is especially um, purely on purely electrical basis, let's say on the lower scale type of vehicles uh, in the sense of range and capacity, think urban air mobility, for instance. Um, we've been developing, building, testing uh, innovative hybrid propulsion system, subsystem, and components since back in 2010. And um, we, uh, we had a flagship demonstrator running, the EFAN-X, um, in partnership with Rolls-Royce, um, where uh, we recently had to, uh, to, to, we really wrapped it up because we realized that we had learned all what we had to learn with that product, with that configuration, it was a very exploratory type of initiative, right? Without any direct product uh, association, uh, we have uh, explored the pros and contras of that specific architecture. And uh, we really captured invaluable learnings as we continue exploring the technologies uh, required to achieve our ambitions in zero emission aviation. Hybrid electric architectures are definitely still something very much on our radar. Uh, hydrogen is a very interesting topic, Amanda, because this is for us really one of the most promising climate neutral, zero emission technologies. It can be created uh, from renewable energy sources if we you know, steer away from black hydrogen, which is, I believe, 90% of all hydrogen produced on the globe today is, is not from renewable energy sources. So this is definitely something not to be forgotten, but it nearly really um, eliminates CO2 emissions if, if produced um, renewably. So 
the the cost of hydrogen is definitely another parameter you need to put in the equation but it's uh, it's forecast to significantly reduce as we scale with it um, lowering the barriers to entry enabling multiple industries to significantly reduce their climate impact and at the same time there's also a lot of challenges of course to think about the infrastructure of course safety first always and um, it's going to be complicated because in, in a way you have kerosene today feeding the whole chain um, of, of aviation products. And we see that if we really go into a sustainable technology uh, field, uh, the trend could be to have different solutions for different ranges of aircraft. On long range, for instance, we won't get away. I hope my, my engine manufacturer colleagues will will pass me the, the, the word, we won't get away from flying from, from, from gas turbines um, anytime, anytime soon. That's where um, sustainable uh, alternative fuels will play a key role to really lower the environmental impact as much as possible. So I hope I didn't, I gave enough, uh, uh, enough let's say, highlights of, uh, of all what is really relevant to us on, on the topic, Amanda. Oh, thank you. And, and I appreciate you pointing out, and I think we're going to talk about it a little bit in our next session, that not all hydrogen is created equal. So, uh, Absolutely. yeah. So, so I'm going to move on. Um, you mentioned the um, autonomous taxi takeoff and landing demonstration. And some of the questions have been asking, so, so how did that happen? Was that um, your uh, eVTOLs, uh, the, the city airbus or Vahana? What, what was involved with that? So uh, our, our mission when it comes to autonomy is not necessarily to, to take autonomy as target in itself. A lot of what we do already uh, is, is based on, autonomous, uh, on autonomy. Think of the big features, right, on, on, a, on our aircraft, the autopilot, um, fly-by-wire autopilot, auto land type of features. Um, think of satellites. Um, there's nothing more autonomous than a satellite flying uh, totally independently in service for more than 15 years. Um, so we don't want to have autonomy as an objective, but we really want to explore all associated technologies um, with the potential to contribute to, um, to fuel saving, providing also a solution to pilot shortage, where you may think, oh, well, you just spoke about, you know, we're no longer on the exponential path so, uh, you know, it may be fine to, we won't need these, these, these hundred thousands of, of pilots we were forecasting. Fair enough. Um, yet, let's not forget that with a double um, uh, uh, cockpit, the airlines do have substantial operating costs when it comes to type ratings, trainings, et cetera, et cetera. So, especially thinking about the fact that um, sustainable um, technologies in their novelty will probably also mean uh, the customers will need to absorb the cost, the costs, right? So it is our duty to think of all what we could to put them in a better position in terms of operating costs. Uh, so by looking at this, thinking about increased fuel saving, a reduction of operating costs, we, um, we are really um, looking at the key industrial challenges, right, of tomorrow and uh, uh, wishing to leverage on opportunities to improve, improve aircraft safety. Let's not forget that safety comes first always and we will not be going into technologies where we have the slightest doubt that this will uh, reduce the safety levels as we, uh, as we know them today. So with all this in mind, we launched back in 18 our demonstrator um, to really understand what is the impact of autonomy on, on, on aircraft. And again, we, uh, we uh, achieved uh, in this sense a world first in aviation with uh, autonomous taxiing, takeoff landing, using fully automatic uh, vision-based flight tests using onboard image recognition technology, where the algorithms were trained in the Silicon Valley in our A-cubed facilities, where we have significant um, expertise um, to, to do that really in, um, 
groundbreaking and uh, safety uh, safety oriented way. So let me, I wanna, wanna clarify. So this was in the Vahana or what type of vehicle was used for these autonomous takeoff taxi landing tests? As as you as you as you know Amanda very well, we were proud to be the first out there to fly with our with our Vahana, our our eVTOL, um, tilting uh, tilted wing uh, eVTOL. Um, you know, any other day you see on the on, on on YouTube. Now I don't know how many eVTOL projects there are out there. Um, Probably an order of magnitude, the hundreds. Well, Airbus was the first was the first to fly, so it's not only PowerPoint slides. And uh, it is through what we have learned um, with Lahana that we really gained a significant uh, competitive advantage when it comes to alternative propulsion. Uh, Lahana is fully electric um, propelled, um, but also indeed um, flight controls with a significant component of artificial intelligence um, in them which opened the dialogue with the FAA and also with the ASA in terms of how do you certify such a system, right? Uh, so the, 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 the big question of trusted artif and safe artificial intelligence going from um, a deterministic to a non-deterministic type of system. So absolutely, we were spearheading the pack with Vahana um, and uh, the learnings from that specific uh, program flew seamlessly into the rest of the Airbus portfolio. So the very same algorithms on Atoll, allowing us again to uh, to have a first uh, first uh, ever um, automated um, taxi takeoff and landing. But also, let's not forget our our helicopters. Um, so uh, there, the link is even is even more immediate. So autonomy uh, applied to, to to helicopters. So definitely um, a pioneering uh, program, which uh, allowed us to learn lots and uh, uh, really to seamlessly read across all what we've learned to to the other uh, core Airbus Airbus programs. So let me. I'm just going to add. Uh, for the folks who were asking the question, that those demonstrations were done in an A350 airliner. So these were not unmanned vehicles. These were <laughs> sitting there, and I love the video, not touching the controls, doing an automated takeoff, automated taxi, automated landing uh, on, on a very, very large airliner. Um, Absolutely. And since it was the final, uh, the final flight uh, took place really in the at the peak of the pandemic crisis in in Europe. We um, we used uh, we we did the piggy ride on on a on a shuttle flight. Uh, so on an A three fifty, one of our flight test aircraft dispatched from Toulouse to Beijing to pick up uh, medical goods, so masks and um, uh, ventilators. Uh, which were then uh, distributed largely to hospitals uh, across Europe. Uh, so it, uh, we used uh, the chance of this um, of this um, of this flight really to test to test the algorithms, not to you know put additional burden on our flight test colleagues in such a critical period. And so it's again, uh, I believe, an example of how uh, also in crisis mode ingenuity collaboration and creativity uh, plays an even more significant role than when you're just flying in cruise mode. That's wonderful. Um, so let me, let, let me uh, uh, pivot. We've gotten a couple of questions to say, so what does the future look like? I mean, we talked a little bit about the propulsion, um, trying to decarbonize, but there's, you know, there's recent news that Airbus has been flying a blended wing body demonstrator. Do you see this as replacing the tube and wing uh, for future Airbus designs? I'm very glad. I'm very glad about this question. And thank you for catching up on our, for, for noticing uh, our Maverick demonstrator. Indeed, indeed, blended wing is a very interesting concept. Not, not new, as we know, but indeed, in light of uh, recent um, technology um, development, and the, the, it, it offers opportunity 
um, opportunities which which become extremely interesting. Think about hydrogen tanks, for instance. So um, it's definitely the way to go, testing things at smaller scale, uh, seeing what the challenges are before uh, and in parallel, of course, um, not forgetting ground testing, also as a means to validate solutions before we take full scale uh, demonstrator to the skies. So it's definitely one of the very interesting demonstrators we're pursuing together with others uh, with other partners um, in, in Europe, but not only. Uh, we are, for instance, um, looking with a lot of, in, of interest when it comes to electrical uh, propulsion and hybrid um, architectures at distributed propulsion. When, when you put uh, uh, electrification in the equation, then you open the door to uh, a whole new, very interesting set of architectures. You don't have to have, you know, uh, 20 megawatts uh, hanging under the pylon if it's electricity we're talking about. You can distribute it. Um, and this is something which I believe is also a very promising concept, especially if you think about with the regional type of, uh, of ranges. And uh, so definitely something on our radars, um, among other, uh, architectures, which uh, are definitely uh, becoming interesting again, maybe in the light again of the new um, developments when it comes to propulsive technology. Okay, so so we talked about propulsion. We've talked a little bit about airframe. What about digital design and collaboration? But what do you think? Well, see the future in aviation and aerospace on that. This is um, it's an it's an interesting question because I'm I'm also um, often asked, well, is artificial intelligence and digitalization a technology per se? And well, what I see is that there is a component of it in all what we do. So these are very highly transverse dimensions common to many technology developments, and where um, we're talking about sciences which are not specific to our industry, um, common to many, developed in other industries to begin with, where um, definitely the challenge is to integrate these in all what we do. And if it flies, it needs to respond to the most stringent safety standards. So artificial intelligence is a fantastic enabler, definitely. On ground, we have already we we already uh, reap the fruits. You know, think about Skywise uh, via data collection on our aircraft. Um, we are able to offer to our customers um, predictive maintenance type of services, so that as soon as the aircraft lands, we know already uh, if there is anything to be taken care of. Uh, and whenever the regular inspection checks come, we know already uh, what needs to be uh, prioritized before even, you know, going into the specific maintenance operations. So um, on ground, it's already an asset and it's already uh, demonstrating its value very tangibly. We have more than 30 airlines already uh, on our Skywise um, services platform. Uh, when it comes again to making it fly, uh, this is where the challenge lies, right? Because again, safety first always. So how do we certify systems where artificial intelligence plays a significant role? And this is where, again, safe um, AI, um, trustworthy <laughs> AI, explainability of artificial intelligence play a significant role. And that's where we're working hand in hand across the industry and of course, with the certification authorities FAA, EASA have this really very, very high on the radars. So to summarize, digitalization is something which is common to many, many industries. Let's not forget the specificities of making it fly on an aircraft. And when it comes to industry, the potential is, is infinite. And we're, um, of course, deploying uh, gradually uh, our digital backbone approach, we call it DDMS at Airbus. It's digital design, manufacturing, and services. Really a holistic end-to-end -end approach to, um, to all Airbus processes. Um, 
where um, indeed uh, the digital twin in it and 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 uh, enabling really a seamless, uh, let's say, uh, um, evolution of our processes from pre-design to services. So let me wrap it up with the the last and possibly most major component of what you oversee, and that's the people. I mean, the technology at uh, at Airbus is a large organization. So how do you stimulate creativity and and that inventiveness uh, across such a diverse field? And what advice can you give to the students who are thinking about what they're going to be doing or what they should be looking at for the next, say, 30 years of their careers? So I, 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 I start by your last remark. The answer is clear. So join the aviation industry. There's no more exciting um, industry with really significant challenges ahead of us, but really the opportunity to change the world into a better place. This is where you have all the levers you need to really looking now into the decarbonization type of, of perspective. It's, it's, uh, there's no more challenging place to be with a very, very strong technology content. And we engineers love that. And um, with, uh, again, an emotional component linked to flying. If you're passionate as I am about, about flying, and as you are certainly, uh, Amanda, this is the place, this is the place to be. Um, and our products already do a lot of the work. So it's something which automatically motivates and engages our people. But it's definitely, it's definitely not enough, especially when going through times of crisis like this, where you need to make sure you get your priorities straight and that you stay focused. So maybe there's not so much margin for pure exploration of new fields. You really need to stay focused on what has uh, a very specific product, um, uh, you know, uh, link and bridge to industrialization. Um, it's fundamental to, it's no rocket science, to be really authentic, uh, I think, and uh, without fear of, of showing that sometimes you don't have the answers. Again, with COVID-19, we were faced with something which never happened before. So how do we adjust the manufacturing rates of our products based on which models? The models don't exist. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think a key into having really um, your, 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 your teams following you is, is, is not to be afraid of saying, it when the answer is not in sight and at the same time being really transparent when the answer is in sight communication is key sharing the information is key and always keeping of course a certain optimism in terms of perspective uh, light at the end of the tunnel uh, is is definitely also a, a fundamental ingredient let's say in my perspective so in my introduction, I, I mentioned that you were the first woman on the Airbus Executive Committee. So is that a novelty or how do you see um, diversity playing into the future of aerospace? And what would uh, yeah. we add to that? What can we do to bring more diversity into our workforce? Yes. This is a topic, Amanda, very, very, uh, very dear to my heart. Um, diversity, not only in the sense of gender, but I've, I've really had the first-hand experience on my own skin. I mean, I'm Italian. In, in a company, which if you look at the European roots, is, is Franco-German with a, a UK and Spanish component. And then, of course, uh, uh, roots grown also in, in the United States and in China. So Italy doesn't really play a role in that. So uh, as, as a woman, at the beginning, I was, I was young. I'm working on that year by year. <laughs> but uh, Italian, I wasn't fitting in any of the, you know, type of, um, uh, of the majority. Let's put it this way. I, was, I wasn't fitting in the scheme of, of the majority of the population at Airbus. 
and uh, which liberates you at some extent. You don't have any national expectation to fulfill and um, allows you really, if you have the courage of bringing in something different, you really see how that comes to fruition. Um, having a team of people thinking all the same way, coming from the same school with the same background, same gender, same um, uh, you know, cultural um, and ethnical background will fatally bring you to think in the same way. And when you're in our business where safety comes first and above any other consideration, it, I consider it very risky to have a bunch of maybe brilliant people but thinking all alike. So diversity is mandatory. It keeps you safe and it's a pain in the neck <laughs> to manage because as a leader, you need to continuously adapt and make space for diversity to also express itself. And it's not always easy because sometimes you would just like to, you know, can we please agree finally and just stop discussing and, and, and just take things as they are. And you keep on getting buts and ifs and objections. And this is incredibly valuable, tiring and valuable. You don't want to be surrounded by people thinking like you. You don't want complacency. You want people actively exercising their duty to dissent. It's difficult to manage, but it will keep you safe and it will guarantee you develop the most innovative and break, groundbreaking solutions. Well, thank you, Grazia. I mean, your insight into the technological advancements as well as the cultural issues is going to be invaluable. And I'm sure it's going to spark uh, a lot of conversations amongst our attendees. And now I look forward to moderating the, the Forum 360 panel that's going to be coming up in a, about a half an hour, where we're going to discuss the promise of electric propulsion across the aviation spectrum. Now later uh, at 2.30 uh, Eastern, uh, the University of Professor uh, Ella Atkins will moderate the afternoon Forum 360 panel We'll, which will be examining the report from the National Academies of Engineering on the National Blueprint for Advanced Air Mobility. So for our attendees, please do check out the hub programming. You're going to learn about the X-59 quiet, super, uh, technology, quiet supersonic technology X-plane. Uh, that's coming up at 11.30. The rising leaders in aerospace will be discussing Embracing Generational Gaps in the Workplace at 12.13, or excuse me, 1230 on the special sessions page. And uh, Aerospace America will be discussing minimizing the COVID-19 risks when flying at 2 p.m. in a session with Mike Delaney, Boeing's Vice President for Digital Transformation and lead for the Confident Travel Initiatives. Now, don't forget that uh, while we aren't meeting in person this year, uh, not out in Reno with my son, uh, you can still join the discussion online using the hashtag AIAA Aviation. And the AIAA staff are monitoring the hashtag for your comments and insights. And we look forward to hosting a productive conversation throughout the forum. Now, this is the time uh, we get to have a break, grab your coffee, and we're going to be back for another packed day of uh, virtual activity. So thank you everyone and uh, stay tuned.